This episode of Mogul is brought to you by Sonos. With Sonos, you can stream all your favorite music and podcasts to any room and every room at once. Me personally, I like all kinds of music, and this is kind of like a hip-hop rap confession, hashtag rap confession. I love listening to ABBA on my Sonos. Like, you know, ABBA, Bee Gees, um, Fleetwood Mac. I love Fleetwood Mac. The album, Rumors, you know, people like Combat, Reggie, for real. I'm like, yeah, like, it's good music too, man. Don't be don't be a hardhead and, 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 and listen to some ABBA on the Sonos. To learn more about Sonos, go to sonos.com slash mogul. That's S-O-N-O-S dot com slash mogul. M-O-G-U-L. All right, so the DMX situation was really my fault. What right? happened? That's what All we right? keep hearing. Like, oh, man, that's the craziest shit. That's Dave Lighty, Chris Lighty's brother. The story he's about to tell is about a little misunderstanding that happened back in 1998 when Dave was working with Chris at Def Jam. Someone asked Dave for his opinion on a new DMX album. At that time, DMX was the biggest name in rap. They were like, what you think of it? And I was like, ah, he had hotter joints on his mixtape, you know, me personally. But I like it, you know. And I guess they thought that was a diss. Somebody in the room thought I was trying to diss and ran back and told DMX. That's how Dave tells the story. Eric Nix, who worked with Chris, heard another version. He heard that Dave said something a lot less flattering. DMX had a complex about be- being called a crackhead. He had a serious complex back then about being called a, a, a drug addict. and Because in certain instances, yeah. I'm not saying he's a crackhead, but sometimes DMX yeah. moves crackish. Yeah. DMX got wind of what was said, and all he heard was lighty. Whatever version you believe, DMX was pissed. And DMX is not the kind of cat to take a diss and let it go. I mean, this is a guy who's got a rap sheet almost as long as his set list. So DMX is like, fuck this. I'm going to fuck Lighty up. Problem was, he was after the wrong Lighty. He thought it was Chris Lighty who talked shit about him. Chris was in the office one day and DMX was in the office. DMX seen Chris and was like, yo. Chris turned around and DMX sneak punched Chris. Boom! Punched him. Punched him in the face. Broke his teeth. Knocked his tooth out. Clean out, right? All hell broke loose. In a weird way, getting punched in the face by DMX was a measure of just how far Chris had come. I mean, he's no longer knuckling up with unknown cats in the club. He's getting sucker punched by the biggest rap at the time. Talk about a come up. Chris was furious, and he wanted to fuck DMX up. So he rounded up a group of his friends, the old Violator crew. And they went looking for X, so they could handle this thing like they would have done back in the Bronx. The problem was, things were different now. You know, everybody's well off. DMX is well off. So it's not like, oh, he lives over here and he's going to be on this corner tonight like the regular hood dude. Like, he's anyway. He could be in the Four Seasons. He could be in the Peninsula. He could have traveled. He could have left the city. He could, he could be in Boston. He could, he could be, be wherever. Miami, he could be in Brazil He's got right now. money. He's, you know, it's different. So we can't just pull up on a set and just light it up. I bet you he was in Japan. <laughs> but then, Leo Cohen came up with an idea for how to settle things. One that would appease Chris Lighty and keep DMX from getting hurt. DMX would give Chris a cut of the royalties from his next album, and in return, Chris would not come after him. At uh, first, he was the, we're going to tear his wig off. <laughs> it was, <laughs> oh, it's going down, <laughs> you know? And then after the conversation, it was, all right, we're going to do some business shit here. And you got a big check. You got a big check. You got a big check. And, you know, I ain't really going to disclose all right, I have. Course, but, course. you know, it was the worst punch DMX could have ever thrown in his life, <laughs> life and, you know, cost him a check. We don't know exactly what the terms of the deal were, but if Chris got a check, it would have been a big check. I mean, DMX's next album, Flesh of My Flesh, Blood of My Blood, it went platinum three times. That's over three million copies sold. So any piece of that is going to be a lot of dough. It's kind of like Chris turned DMX into this hip-hop version of the Tooth Fairy. Except instead of finding a dollar on his pillow, it would have been a check with a lot of O's. I'm Reggie Yose, and this is Mogul, The Life and Death of Chris Lighty, a production of Gimlet Media and the Loudspeakers Network. Around this time, it was like Lighty was unstoppable. Everything he touched turned into money. 
even a punch in the face. The dude just stayed winning. But I'm going to tell you right now, everything was not as perfect as it looked. And in this episode, we're going to get into some darker shit. The kind of shit people don't want to talk about and the kind of shit people don't want to hear about either. And I got to warn you, there's violence involved. Not the kind of violence we've been hearing about earlier in this series. It's a different kind. And we'll get to that. But first, we have to tell you what happened next to Chris. In 1999, Chris decided to leave Def Jam and go on his own. He wanted to focus all his attention on his own thing, a hip-hop management company he'd been running on the side. The company's name? Violator. That name is, of course, a throwback to the crew Chris ran with back when he was carrying crates for DJ Red Alert. With Chris running it full-time, Violator took off. And by the mid-2000s, it was established as one of the industry's leading management companies. The Violator office is on 25th Street in Chelsea. It was inside this handsome 16-story building. Bubba Barker joined the company as an intern in 2006. Here he is describing exactly what it looked like inside. You come up the elevator, and there were these big silver doors, like a silver covering. I came in, and you got to ring a bell. And you come in, and there are these uh, yellow walls throughout, but you can't see the walls because there are so many plaques all over these walls. The plaques are covering the walls in all aspects. You can't like, even like see the, Yeah, you can't even see the walls, but you know it's yellow behind them. Those plaques are for gold and platinum albums. That's albums that sell over 500,000 and a million copies. Albums by artists like Q-Tip, Busta Rhymes, LL Cool J, Missy Elliott, Capone and Noriega, and high-profile R&B singers like Mariah Carey and Maxwell. And all of these stars were rep by Violator Management. And then you had the cubicles where, you know, all of the, uh, the junior managers and their interns were at that time. And then you would pass the, the real interns who were just waiting for somebody to say, come do something for me, which is where I sat. All of those interns and junior managers, they were all desperate to impress the man in charge, Chris Lighty. I said to myself, go introduce yourself to him. Let him know you're here and you're ready to work. So when I went to see him, he was coming out of his office and obviously he was on three phones at one time. He had on this uh, a sheepskin jacket it was beautiful it was black he had on a white shirt some jeans and some some gucci boots he looked about his business he looked like he meant something and i was like how you doing my name is bubba i'm an intern here he was like all right what's up that's what's up get ready to work he just walked out and that was that you know what i mean that was the first time i ever spoke to him chris didn't just look about his business he was about his business and he wanted everyone who worked at Violated to be the same way. You had to be on top of your game 24-7, 365. He was there at 8 o'clock every day, rain, sleet, hell, or snow. Like, why are you late, dude? Chris, I don't got to be here till 9. It's 9.02. Something could happen between that. You could have missed a call. He would say things like that. Not to be stern, but to be like, just think about it. Just think about it. You could have missed a call at 901. And you don't want to miss that call because the guys on the other end of the line were not fucking around. Guys like Busta Rhymes. Busta's a rapper from Brooklyn, known for his cartoonish videos and a voice that sounds something like gravel going through a blender. And I mean that in a good way. Busta's voice is iconic. But while Busta's voice and his flow might be hard, he was one client Chris had to handle very delicately. He had called the office just to see the vibe and... He'd be like, yo, let me speak to Chris. And you got to recognize his voice. Don't ever get him twisted who he is. So so don't don't, don't is. say who this is because he'll disrespect you. So you'd be like, all right, hold on. So you go see Chris. Got bust on the line. And it, depending on the day or the time, he could say, I'll call him back, or he can say, I ain't here. But the thing with Buster be, Buster be right downstairs. And come upstairs, if I tell him he ain't here right now, he comes upstairs to check. Because he'll see Chris's driver outside. I didn't know he was outside. You know what I'm saying? So he'll come upstairs. And yo, who answered the phone for me? You know what I mean? Him? They play it, it was him. <laughs> you lied to me, homie? You don't even fucking know me. Was he serious? Very serious. 
These artists, they were on Chris all the time. When he managed someone, it wasn't just about marketing, promotion, and contracts. It was their lives. If somebody needed to be bailed out of jail, he bailed them out. If someone needed money, he'd loan it to them. He was there for the big stuff and the small stuff too, down to the hems of their pants. Uh, I'm Puerto Rican. Ain't no doubt about it. That's the homie Noriega. He had some huge hits in the 1990s and, like me, is now a podcaster. Nori was managed by Chris, and he told my producer Matt and I this story that gives you a measure of just how involved Chris was in the lives of his clients. I'm getting married. This is my first marriage, my second marriage right now. God bless my wife. I love you, baby girl. I'm coming home to you right now. But my first marriage, uh, I'm getting married, and I'm Puerto Rican. So I, I, what does that mean? I stick my fucking hems in my... The bell bottoms, I stick my bell bottoms in my socks. So I, that's how I walk down the aisle. Quick visual. Nori's saying he tucks his pant legs into his socks. And he told us he liked to stick his cash in there too. Because, you know, because that's how I do it right now. Like if I had on pants right now, like it'd be in my, one, one, one would be in my socks and the other would be my money. You know what I'm saying? Like it's just how I was raised. I can't do it. So I'm I'm doing it. I'm spending two hundred fifty thousand for this wedding, and I still got like five hundred bucks on one sock, five hundred bucks on the other sock. So Chris comes and goes, "Oh no!" <laughs> and this nigga pulled my shit out my. He pulls it. He pulls the shit out out my sock, and my mom's. Um, you know we got black. I got black friend. My whole black friend. He stood up and started clapping. It was like. What do you think that says about him as a person, that story? Uh, about Chris? Yeah, what does it tell us about him? It was that he just he just played the Fogger figure. He didn't know he was playing the Fogger figure. I didn't know he was playing the Fogger figure. But he was way beyond my management. He was way beyond... Uh, was uh, way beyond uh, business. Business. You know what I'm saying? Way beyond that. And um, shit, I wish he was here for me to appreciate it. I talked to a lot of the artists that Chris worked with, and they said similar things. The artists that Chris managed genuinely seemed to love him. They trusted him. They felt like he understood them, knew he wanted what was best for them. These bonds were some of the biggest names in the industry, and they were a big part of why Chris and Violator reached the top. It wasn't just artists who leaned on Chris, though. A lot of people in the industry relied on Chris, and for more than just fashion advice, too. By the mid-2000s, Chris had been in the game for over 15 years. He was becoming an elder statesman, the kind of guy you'd go to if you needed advice. Sophia Cheng was a manager, too. She worked with the RZA, Old Dirty Bastard, and A Tribe Called Quest. And she and Chris, they were good friends who went way back. I called Chris my rock of Gibraltar. Chris was the place that I always knew I could go when I needed to feel safe. I pitbull all fucking day long as a manager. I go hard all day long. I beat the shit out of people all day long. But I am still a woman. And I still do want to feel safe. You know, I would go to his office, and he had these big shoulders, you know. And he would be sitting in his chair, and I would just grab him around the shoulders, and he would let me do it. He's not that guy. He's not a touchy-feely guy. He was never like, oh, Soph, come and give me a hug. Quite the opposite. But he always let me do it because he knew I needed it. I would go to his office and I would just cr- literally cry on his shoulder. And I have really these tactile memories, you know. And I remember he always, he favored blue chambray shirts. And I remember I would cry on his shoulder and I would get up and his shirts would just be tear-stained. And remember, if I called him my rock of Gibraltar, I was not alone. (laughs) He was that to many, 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 many people. Chris had a lot of close relationships with his clients, his co-workers, his friends. He also had a family of his own. He had three children, but although he'd been in a couple of serious relationships, he'd never been married. This was about to change, though. Around this time, Chris met his future wife, Veronica. They ran in the same circles, shared a few friends, were both part of the hip-hop scene. They had another thing in common, too. Both of them were parents. 
and in 2002, they decided to blend their families and get married. When did you hear that they were getting married? Uh, when he called me on Memorial Day weekend while I was in the middle of producing one of Puffy's white parties, losing my mind in the Hamptons. I remember I was driving and he called me and I could see my phone ringing. I didn't pick it up. He called me again three times in a row. So I was like, got to pick it up. That's Jessica Rosenblum. She's one of hip hop's premier event planners. In fact, the reason she knew Chris so well was because they used to run events together at the legendary hip hop venue, The Tunnel. So Jessica picks up the phone and she's like, what's up? And he was like, uh, uh, and he used to do this a lot. He'd call me and start stuttering at the beginning of the call only when he wanted something. He'd be like, uh, uh, I need something. I was like, I know that's what's going to come after. Uh, 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 I need something. I was like, what? He's like, I need you to do my wedding. And it was like in two months. Coming up after the break, Chris gets married and it wasn't no ordinary wedding. This episode of Mogul is brought to you by Sonos. I use my Sonos speakers in my house every day because I love music in every room. You know, my my place is two floors and I'll be on the second floor playing Fela Kuti and then I'll go downstairs and my kids will be playing some trap music like Travis Scott and they'll put me onto music and they'll come upstairs and I'll put them onto music and it's just really like it's this organic educational kind of like eco like music ecosystem that all of us share and I just think it's absolutely great I can't live without music and I can't imagine them living without music Sonos lets you control everything using the Sonos app on your phone so that you can enjoy all the sounds you love to learn more go to sonos.com slash mogul that's s-o-n-o-s dot com slash mogul Welcome back to Mogul. All right, let's pick up where we left off. Chris's wedding. This was not going to be your average wedding. In fact, it was going to be spectacular. A real hip-hop event. To receive an invitation to this wedding was like receiving an invitation to the royal wedding, dude. You know, like everyone's going to be there. That's Derek Jones, better known as D-Nice. He was on the guest list, but honestly, he was probably the least famous person on there. It was like a roll call of hip-hop's biggest names. Everyone from, you know, Lior. Lior was his best man. Jacob the Jeweler. Puff, 50 Cent. You know, Nori, the Violator Crew. The wedding was in Miami at the Vizcaya Museum. Which is a historical um, estate in Miami. It's beautiful. And I really produced a spectacular wedding. A spe- I, I looked at it that I produced a spectacular event. I had never seen anything like that. You know, like right. we stayed at, we all have rooms at like the Four Seasons. My first time ever staying at a hotel like that. Right. You know, it was, it was a beautiful wedding. It was a beautiful moment. And when the time came for Chris and Veronica to say their vows, Chris didn't say for richer or for poorer. He said for richer and for richer. And of course, as well as being so lavish, this wedding was also so hip hop. You know, just the music alone. Like, it was great. Like, it was fun rocking classic hip hop. And if you knew Chris, hip hop played everywhere. Old school hip hop, especially throughout his house, in the cars. And that re- that the wedding was definitely an old school hip hop vibe. During that wedding, man, there was you can clearly see the happiness. Like this was what he was looking for. And in all those years after that, you know, I wanted to emulate that happiness that my guy had. You know, like the happiness that he was feeling because everything that he did was for his wife. And every move that he made was to empower his family and to be better for his wife. That's the truth. Not everyone was as impressed with Chris and Veronica's wedding. In fact, one of the most important people from Chris's past, DJ Red Alert, actually skipped it for the same reason so many people were impressed by it. To Red, the fancy setting, the star-studded guest list, the extravagant ceremony, it didn't make it great. It made it seem kind of fake. Um, I didn't care for the wedding. I didn't know, and nothing against him. I didn't care how the whole thing was arranged. How was it arranged? To me, it was an industry wedding. How was it arranged, though? Number one, 
None of us was in the wedding. The violin. None of Close us. Close friends, okay. You had Leo Cohen's as your best man at the wedding. Mm. I call that an industry wedding. And for all who's a part of it, it's industry affiliated. But when you having industry people in the wedding and none of your true friends, mm. I can't I can't support. I mean, I get it. Weddings, B. It's not just your big day. Everybody in attendance thinks it's their big day too. Someone feels snubbed because they're not in the wedding party. Someone doesn't like the hors d'oeuvres. But some people didn't think Chris and Veronica should be getting married at all. They had concerns that went way beyond the canapes. Here's Eric Nix. I said, Chris, are you making a mistake? And I was like, yo, dog. Because why was he making a mistake? Because this is not the girl you marry. This is the girl you have fun with. This is how everybody viewed her. I'm sorry. She can hear it. I don't care. Like, I'm just... If she's mad because I'm telling the truth, I'm fucking, I'm just going to tell the truth. This is not who you... This is not who you marry. And what would Chris tell you? He told me, yo, she makes me happy. I don't give a fuck what everybody thinks. Despite what Chris said, despite the big, beautiful wedding, there were problems. And Eric wasn't the only one who told us about them. As we spoke to more people, we started to hear about a different side of Chris and Veronica's relationship. And... It wasn't pretty. He did cheat on her. You know, everyone knows that. I don't think he did it in 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 a in a embarrassing way to her. Like he wasn't public, but you know, she did find out. That's Debbie Coda. She worked for Chris at Violator. We heard that Chris was unfaithful from other people we spoke to. John Turk, one of Chris's closest friends, put it a little more bluntly. Eh, his dick stayed on tour, man. He's yeesh. <laughs> Like I said, that's where they got the name Violators from, girls. I think the more and more she found out, then the more and more she let the poison take over in her. You know, I could also understand her, in some extent, being a little bit outspoken and a little bit rude and aggressive or, you know, not giving a fuck, you know, that people are watching or hearing, turned into something on a different level. A lot of people told us the same thing, that it wasn't unusual to see Chris and Veronica in heated public arguments. In, inside clubs, inside events. It, like, she did not care where they popped off. We reached out to Veronica and some other people who were close to her, but they all declined to be interviewed. The people who did talk to us, Chris's friends and family, they painted a very specific picture of who they thought Veronica was and how they saw the relationship. You hear all that shit, and you start to build up a story in your head, boil all the shit down into one simple narrative that Veronica was the bad guy. But then we found something that changed all of that. Late in our research process for the show, one of our producers found a police report. I'm just going to go ahead and read it to you. But before I do, I have to restate that if you have a strong reaction to descriptions of violence, especially against women, you might find this disturbing. The report is dated August 28th, 2005. And this is what it says. Defendant and victim are husband and wife of three years. Wife notified police. Defendant busted her lip with an open fist. Victim had numerous bruises where defendant dragged her on the floor and her face was swollen and red. Upon this unit's survival, we entered the room and victim was on the floor crying with her dress ripped. Victim stated the defendant beat her up several times before and there's been several police reports. Defendant was arrested. The defendant was Chris. Chris had busted Veronica's lip with an open fist. Chris had left numerous bruises. We don't know exactly what happened next, but the documents we found showed that Chris was charged with battery, but the case never went to trial. After finding all of this out, I had no idea what to do with this story. I've been working on this thing for over a year. I've been living it and breathing it. Fuck, I mean, I even have a picture of Chris Lighty on my desk. And I built up this portrait in my head of who he was and what he meant to people. And this police report didn't fit into that portrait. It smashed it all to pieces. It was so hard to reconcile that report with everything else I heard about Chris. The rock of Gibraltar did this. The guy who so many people trusted. The guy who so many people respected. I couldn't wrap my head around it. So I decided to talk to somebody who deals with this shit all the time. I called Kamika Crawford. 
She's the Chief Communications Officer for the National Domestic Violence Hotline. You know, as we roll out this story, um, one of our everybody's concern is like, what should we be careful about as we tell the story? And particularly with regard to this particular issue of the domestic abuse, like, what should we avoid saying? Like, what should we be careful in terms of like telling the story? I think that we have to step back and, and you know, I don't know and can't comment specifically on their situation, but I think the biggest thing that, you know, we, that people should be careful about is placing blame on the victims. And, and I know it just seems obvious, but it's like, well, what did that person do? Well, there had to be something there. Um, you know, he or she must have been doing something um, because I knew this person to be this way. So what did the victim do to provoke that? Um, but no one provokes or does anything that deserves emotional, physical, financial, any type of abuse. I also knew I had to talk to the people closest to Chris about this report. Chris's family had been a part of this project since the beginning. So I wanted to get their response. I started with Nicole, Chris's sister. It's a call that, in truth, I didn't want to make. I mean, how do you tell somebody, we found a police report that says your brother hit his wife? Hello? Hey, Nicole, how are you? Reggie. Oh, hey, Reggie, how you doing? Okay, how's everything? Everything's good, good. Thanks for asking. It's raining cats and dogs in Charlotte, but everything's all right. Yeah. <laughs> so, listen, um, I wanted to share with you, um, you know, we're, we're really digging deep because we're about to finish this, to wrap this story up. And, um, you know, just digging into seeing what happened, you know, with, with, with your brother, you know, ju- you know, during his last day, you know, something came up and it, and, and it really, really, really affected me. Um, and I, I felt it was responsible, my responsibility, you know, to share it to the people closest, share it with the people closest to him. We found this, um, police report, um, with regard to, um, the dom- domestic incident between your brother and and his wife. And I just wanted to, to share that with you because I, I don't know how to handle this thing. Okay, what, what, what's the date? It's the 28th of August, 2005. Mm, okay, 2005. 2005. I, I mean, there was, <laughs> their relationship was so volatile. I'm not surprised that there were so many different <laughs> incidents. Okay. Their, because, their their relationship was so volatile. Right. Um, have I ever seen them in a fight or anything? No, but um, you know, was am I aware of them having arguments? I mean, yeah. Right. I'm. I really. I'm. I can't even tell you that I'm surprised, okay. but you know. I, and I'm not condoning it. I don't. I don't know what the incident is. If it's something that him is it him attacking her? Or yes, her attacking it, it was. Him? It was. It was basically um, <sighs> him attacking her. Oh, um, that she filed. Yes. Well, it was. Yeah. You know, the the police showed up, um, and um, they intervened. Um, you know, she had uh, wounds on her lips and and bruises and a whole nine and and like I said, and when I got this, I, it it. it it, it it's weighing very heavily on me, and and I just wanted to share it with you, you know, just to see what your thoughts were like, how you f- how you feel about this. Um, oh well, you know, I'm definitely not going to condone any man hitting any woman, right? Um, but I also don't condone a woman hitting a man, which I know incidents of that as well, right? Well, it definitely, <laughs> I mean, I if, if it's public record, it's public record. That's not anything that I'm. I, w- I definitely don't want to paint a picture, a tainted picture of him being a, a, an abuser. I tried to talk to Veronica about this, but she declined to be interviewed. And Chris, of course, can't comment. That feeling that Nicole had, she didn't want this to be the thing that Chris was remembered for. Other people said the same thing. And it got me to think, the truth is none of us want to look at Chris this way. It's awful to think of somebody that you admire being violent towards their spouse. 
It's something that we've wrestled with before when we hear horrible stuff about celebrities. That shit is always hard to reconcile because we love what they do. And sometimes we confuse the work that they do with who they are. This police report, we have to look at it. We got to stare it in the face because it's the truth. It's a part of who Chris was. And it's a part of this story. If you're out there and you or someone you know is going through something like this, know that there are resources for you. Here's Kamika Crawford with more information on the National Domestic Violence Hotline. If anyone is listening, whether you are the victim of a relationship or you are the abusive partner or you are a friend or family member, the National Domestic Violence Hotline is there 24 hours, seven days a week. Um, We don't close. And you can reach out to us by calling 1-800-799-SAFE or 1-800-799-7233. Or you can chat with us on our website at www.thehotline.org. You'll find all of this in our show notes. Coming up on Mogul, we go deeper and find out more about what Chris hid from the world. How did you not see it? We all ask ourselves these questions, right? How did you not see it? It was one of your closest friends. You loved him so dearly. You talked about so much and you didn't see it. But I realized that I think he parsed out the information. I don't think he told any one person everything. New episodes of Mogul come out every Friday. Mogul is a production of Gimlet Media and the Loudspeakers Network. This episode was produced by Eric Eddings and Meg Driscoll with help from Isabella Kulkarni, Jonathan Mena, and Peter Bresnan. Our senior producer is Matthew Nelson. Our editors are Lynn Levy, Caitlin Kenny, and Chris Morrow. Fact-checking by Michelle Harris. Sound design and mixing by Haley Shaw. Music direction by Matthew Bow. This episode was scored by Nana Quibena, with additional music by Prince Paul and Don Newkirk and Haley Shaw. Thank you to Kamika Crawford, Gina Moore, and Bruce Shapiro for their advice on this episode. If you like the show, please go rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It's a great way to help new people find out about the show. Follow us for all of the latest news and a behind-the-scenes look at the making of the show. Our handle is at mogul. Hey, Mogul listeners. If you're looking for more podcasts about music, check out Song Exploder from Radiotopia. On the show, they bring you all types of musicians. Ghostface Killer, Solange, Bjork, Iggy Pop, Gorillaz, U2, and more. And then the musician goes deep into dissecting one of their songs and the story of how it got made. Like, how did they come up with the concept? Why did they layer the vocals in a certain way? Or why did they choose a specific instrument? It's a show all about the creative process, And even if you don't know the song or the band, it's really fascinating to hear how a track gets built. You can find Song Exploder on Apple Podcasts, Radio Public, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks to our sponsor, Sonos, the home sound system. With Sonos, you can enjoy all the music and podcasts you love anywhere in your home. To learn more, go to sonos.com slash mogul. That's S-O-N-O-S dot com slash mogul, M-O-G-U-L.